Danielle with Put a Finish on it. Some months ago, I was browsing, as I do, the shelves of my favorite used bookstore. I pulled out Sixpence House because the cover was made to look like an old falling apart book, and I found this intriguing. I glanced at the back and saw that it was about a man who moved with his family to a tiny town in Wales. A town that had 1,500 people and 40 bookstores. It's only recently when I inspected the book more thoroughly that I realized that it's memoir and not fiction. Sixpence House, Lost in a Town of Books, covers the time in author Paul Collins' life when he's waiting for his first book to come out. This was back in 2000 when his editor informed him that publishing would be delayed because Harry Potter had used up all the paper and he was not kidding. Collins and his wife move with their toddler from San Francisco to Hay on Wye. The author's family is British, so he's been to this amazing town of books a few times before. I'm gonna spoil the ending a little bit right now and let you know that this memoir is not about settling down in the Welsh countryside to live forever in a mecca of book lovers, because that does not actually end up happening. This memoir is about books themselves and their fate. As an author with his first book about to come out and as an avid collector of rare and aged tomes, Collins is acutely aware of the likelihood that he and the books he writes will eventually be forgotten. He describes one bookstore as the de facto library of the forgotten, with both everything you could want and everything that nobody could ever want. There are piles of books sitting out in the elements in Hay remainders sent by the shipping container full from the US and they just don't sell. Collins picks out a few of these kinds of books and tells us a few of their secrets, wanting to bring them out of obscurity. The writing itself is entertaining. He has some great and rather forceful descriptions, like the street smells like it is paved with kidney stones. An element I really appreciated in this book is that each chapter's title is a clever, complete sentence. Well, chapter 4 looks for a place to call its own, and chapter 14 is awfully late to be introducing the title setting. We get to see him go over the edits in his manuscript by hand on paper and learn the power of the word stet. As an editor, I enjoyed going through Colin's experience of settling on a title for his manuscript and going through and accepting or steading the edits. Collins sprinkles witty cultural commentary throughout his book. He even has a gutsy, tongue-in-cheek, but not really, chapter entitled Chapter 11 Judges Books by Their Covers. Then he proceeds to do just that, and he makes generalizations about a book's quality based on its size and shape, and cover color, and the font style, the matte finish or glossy finish of the cover, and the placement of the author photo, and whether or not it's in color or black and white. There is an implicit code that customers rely on. If a book cover has raised lettering, metallic lettering, or raised metallic lettering, then it is telling the reader, hello, I am an easy to read work on espionage, romance, a celebrity, and or murder. To readers who do not care for such things, this lettering tells them, hello, I am crap. I had to laugh when I read this thinking of booktube's love of pretty covers and fancy font. And I wonder if there's been a shift in perception in the 14 years since Collins has expressed this view. Overall, I really enjoyed Collins' love affair with books and his experience of being an author. I think that many booktubers would love this book about books, and I hope you check it out. Thanks for watching!